So the first session uh, for today is uh, getting started with Camelotic uh, data collection with Reddit. Um, let's see. I want to quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Philip Mai. I'm the co-director and senior researcher here at the Ryzen Social Media Lab. And with me today is uh, Anatoly Gruz. He's the Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor at Ted Rogers School of Management. And he's also the Director of Research at the Ryzen Social Media Lab. So I want to get some housekeeping stuff out of the way before we start. So again, today is the first session. Uh, of, we're focusing mostly on Reddit and uh, Reddit collection. The next session is in two weeks, and that's going to cover um, now that you have the data, how do you use it with the perspective API to uh, find um, toxic um, conversation within your data set? One of the unique features of Community Analytics is that it can automatically pinpoint um, incidents of toxicity within a large data set. So this way, you don't have to read through each and every single post or on Reddit or tweet to identify um, those incidents. Now you will be able to zoom in directly to those and look around in those particular area. And then every two weeks after that, between now and the end of July, we will have additional sessions. You can find out more on the community website or on the social media lab website. Also, I just want to flag, we're hiring a postdoc right now. Um, so if you're interested in working with disinformation and misinformation campaign at scale, uh, you should take a look. More information, again, is at the lab's website. You must have expertise in developing and um, evaluating distributed computing solutions for large scale networks. Uh, the ideal candidate is somebody with a computational social science background, information system, uh, network science, and so on. Um, again, you can find out more detail on the lab's website. For those of you who are not familiar with the lab, and this is your first uh, interaction with us, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are. Um, the Social Media Lab is part of Ted Rogers School of Management. We are a multi and so, um, interdisciplinary research lab um, that look at uh, how social media is changing the way people interact and connect. And the main goal of our, of our studies and all of our initiative is to basically look at the, um, the benefits and pitfall of adopting social media, because we know the social media is not going away. We just got to figure out how to basically situate it in our life uh, going forward. So all of our study uh, geared towards that. We have eight main research foci at the lab. Um, we look at things like how social media is being used in academia for teaching and learning. Um, we also develop software like the one that we're showing you today, uh, Comedalytic. Um, we also do research on social media and health um, and uh, well being. Um, we also take a lot of, uh, we, a lot of research on um, privacy, how people perceive their um, uh, privacy um, needs on social media. We look at the spread of disinformation, uh, online social networks, and also we look at trends and um, factors that convince people to use or, or not use social media. The other thing that we um, started doing the last few years is that we started putting out um, public reports on social media usage in Canada, because we, we saw that there was a gap in the, um, the available data in Canada, for example, looking at things like, Who's using social media? Why are they using it? When they do use it, what are their concerns with this? So for example, this past year, we put out um, a report on um, misinformation regarding the infodemic that's happening around COVID. We also look at the state of social media, what social media platforms people are using um, in Canada. And then we also look at privacy. Um, who, uh, who's using it? What kind of uh, privacy concern they have when they are using it? And the other thing that we are known for at the lab, and which is one of the reasons why you guys are here, is the fact that we develop a lot of um, tools and methods for uh, social media research. When we started the lab over a decade ago, we realized that um, there weren't a lot of tools out there that are off the shelf. So if you wanted to do social media research, you had to basically start to learn how to code. So a lot of people came to us and said, hey, how do you guys just get that data? So we decided, okay, since we're making the tools anyway for our own use, let's uh, make it available um, online so that other researchers who might not want to pick up another PhD and learn how to you know, code and learn R and Python. So many of our um, apps and tools are now available online. 
Um, so I just want to flag the social media research toolkit uh, quickly. That's a list of uh, 70 plus social media research tool that we maintain here at the lab. Every year, I and a couple of our students, we comb through the literature to look for new research tool that have been used by other researchers in peer reviewed journals. And then we populate that list. So this way, if you are starting a new research project, that's a good place to start to find out, hey, what are other researchers in the field are using so that you can maybe test one of them out for your own uh, research. So for today, we're gonna to focus on the latest tool that we are, we've developed um, called Communalytic. Uh, for those of you who've already visited the website, you know that Communalytic is a research tool for studying online communities and online discourse. Um, what makes Communalytic unique is that it has the ability to um, pinpoint toxic and anti-social interaction. You can use it to also identify influencer, map share interests, and the spread of misinformation, and detect signs of possible coordination among uh, disparate actors. But again, you don't have to use it for all those things. You can just use it simply as a data collector. So this way, you don't have to set up your own computer. You don't have to learn how to code. If you want to analyze the data that you can get from Cumulitic using other uh, analytical tools, you can. You just use Cumulitic just to get the data from uh, Reddit or Twitter. Um, or uh, uh, Tango, and then export it out. But like I said, we built this out as a full-fledged platform. So this way you really don't have to go anywhere else if you don't want to. But Anatoly will go over some of those features later. Um, with Analytic, you can collect the data, like I said, you can also extract and visualize emojis. So for those of you who are doing visual communication research, and you just want to know, you know how prevalent is the use of emoji within a particular conversation, we now have the ability to pull out each and every single instant of emoji usage in your data set. And you can then export that out so that you can get a count of how and where and when it was used in your data set. Um, and then you can also do text and pattern uh, relation to detect toxic and antisocial interaction. And recently we just added uh, a way to visualize uh, the data uh, that you collected internally within Communalic. Um, before that, you would have to just export the file and then use uh, you know, a third-party software like Yefi, for example, to visualize it. But we realized that that's another piece of software that people have to learn. So we decided to incorporate the network visualization right into Communalytic. So, so there are two versions of Communalytic. Um, the first one is the EDU version. Well, that's designed more for teaching. So for those of you who are um, teaching you know, data analytics or marketing or communication, PR and so on, and you want to incorporate this into your class, over the next few months, we're gonna be releasing uh, sample assignments and stuff like that for the EDU uh, version. The main difference between the EDU and the pro version is that the EDU version has um, smaller um, account caps as far as the number of records, because again, it's designed for students just to give them a, a, a taste of what the type of analysis can be done. The pro version is um, designed for the uh, academic research community, uh, basically for you guys who are here at this uh, presentation. Um, the main difference is again, the number of records that you can keep with the pro, you can keep up to 10 million records um, uh, with the pro. Um, and also there are more uh, data platforms that you can get access to. So for example, the Twitter academic research product track is now available uh, via Community with Pro. You would have to apply to Twitter uh, for access to that track. But once you have access to that track, you can then use Community with Pro to collect the data uh, using that API. Um, so those are the main differences. I just want to go over some examples of research inquiries that the uh, Community can enable. There's a lot of concern now about the level of online toxicity um, online, but to date there's been you know, very few tools off the shelf that you can really use to uh, put a spotlight and study um, this. So this is why we developed this tool. We wanted the ability to study things like what's the prevalence or the types of toxic and antisocial interaction observed in the online discourse? Um, or how does the presence of toxic interaction change the network structure of an online community? So for example, if you capture a data set that's 12 months uh, length, right? You can break it out month by month and, and basically see how when somebody who's behaving in, in an antisocial uh, uh, 
way enter the conversation? How did it change before that, that person or that group entered the conversation? What was the community like after that person comes along? How did the other members of the group change the way they behave now that somebody who's behaving in a way that's antisocial have joined the conversation? Um, how what, did the moderator do anything? When the moderator didn't do anything, did that change the conversation? So now you, there's a way for you to, to study that kind of uh, phenomena. And the other thing is you can look at things like a lot of social media companies are now saying that they are you know, um, actively um, doing content moderation, but here's a way to independently verify like, hi, that's what their stated policy is, but are they following through? Is their AI doing what they say they're doing? Are their uh, human moderator doing what they're doing? Because now there's a way to independently verify to match up their words to their action. Um, and also the other thing you can do for, with this tool is you can look at what type of accounts tend to share misinformation. So for example, if you know or hear of um, a piece of misinformation that's floating around that's linking to a site or a page that is sharing misinformation, you can type in that URL and then you can pull up every single um, account that share that URL. So as a result, now you can examine and look at those accounts and say, okay, what do they have in common? So you can use that, for example, to detect whether there's any coordination between those accounts or is this organic? Because sometimes it is organic. Sometimes the, the, the anger against something or for something uh, might be real and it might be bubbling up from the bottom. But sometimes it might be a coordinated action because somebody is trying to gin up the conversation. But now there's a way to figure that out. So before I go on, I want to touch something. For those of you who have been doing social media research for a while, this is something that I'm sure all of you are already thinking about, the ethical consideration of using this kind of data. But for those of you who are new, I just want to make sure that you're aware that the ethical consideration should be underlining all aspects of social media research from the collection storage analysis. So at every step of the process, you need to actively think about uh, the ethical consideration of how you're collecting the data, how you plan to publish it, how you plan to analyze it. In Canada, uh, research involving human participants is governed by Tri-Council. Um, so but you need to check with your own university and your own research, research board and funders to find out what are the regulations in your region of the world before you start. So don't just willy-nilly jump into the swimming pool without finding how deep the water is, all right? Um, for example, here in Canada, research that are non-intrusive, that does not involve direct interaction between the researcher and the individual through the internet, there is no expectation of privacy and it doesn't require ethic board uh, review. So things like uh, cyber materials, such as documents, records, because basically social media, the part that we give you access to are all public uh, stuff. So we don't give you access to people's DM because we don't have them either. Uh, we don't have access to groups that are private because if they're private, we have uh, no way to access it. Um, so that's not an issue. But there are situations where review might be required. Um, there are digital sites that are in the public domain, but the norms of that particular group or community um, might be that they do expect some level of expectation, but you need to look at the site terms of service, for example, to find out what the cases are um, and so on. So those are something that you wanna consider. But just to flag something for you, one of the things that we've always um, are sensitive to and have always tried to keep a tap on is to see how comfortable people are with different groups of people accessing information. So for the last few years, we've been doing surveys to ask uh, users like how comfortable they are with different people accessing their uh, social media data. So here's the good news. They're very concerned about mar uh, politi um, political parties, marketers, journalists, and others using um, social media data as part of their work. But if you look at the bottom of that list, academic research are, um, are uh, people are least uncomfortable uh, with academic researcher uh, using social media data to do research because they realize that what we're trying to do is basically trying to help society understand society better and there's a benefit to people uh, to have access to this kind of data. So the key takeaway from our various studies on um, privacy and uh, social media data, the takeaway is that it's really not a one size fits all framework. 
Um, so it's hard to say, um, but you have to keep in mind the private concerns vary across uses, users, and data type. So depending on the groups that you're studying, the, your threshold might be different and somebody else doing a different study looking and asking a different question. So just be sensitive to that and be aware of that. For further readings, uh, I'd like to refer you to the um, uh, AYR um, ethics um, uh, guidelines. That's a good place to start. That research community have done an excellent job over the years of basically trying to operationalize what does it mean to operate and do research with social media ethically. So that's a good place to start. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Anatoly and he's gonna go over um, how to collect data with Reddit and what kind of uh, research you can do with Reddit. All right, over to you Anatoly. Hello everyone again. I'm gonna share my slide deck in a second. So I just wanna confirm that you can see my slide deck and you can hear me. I can see it. Okay, excellent. My apology, Zoom is having a bit of technical issues, but hopefully you can still hear me. Yep. My apologies, I'm back here. Can you see me again? Yep, I can. Yes, uh, Zoom was having some troubles this morning. But let me tell you a little bit about Reddit in general. I know some of you haven't done work with Reddit, so it may be useful for you to get a general idea what this platform is about and uh, the communities that exist on the platform. Then I will show you some studies that use Reddit, about Reddit. Uh, those studies will potentially inspire you uh, to explore different research questions in the context of this platform. And finally, we budgeted the rest of the time for two hands-on exercises. We designed the hands-on part is um, to make it very straightforward, kind of easy introduction to, to this platform, communalistic. Uh, but later during this uh, workshop uh, series, the bootcamp that we're organizing, we will exponentially kind of add, add complexity to the analysis. So it's good to, that you attend in the first session, uh, either live or watching it uh, being recorded. Uh, and we look forward to expanding your kind of toolkit and the capacity, research uh, capacity in this area as the bootcamp progresses. So Reddit is known uh, for this tagline that it's uh, the front page of the internet. And one of the reasons uh, for that um, uh, tagline is that quite often people will share links of uh, news stories and other popular online resources and they would uh, start trending on the main platform on reddit.com and eventually would be picked up by other platforms and even mainstream media. Uh, but over the time uh, actually more and more people joined the platform, the Reddit itself, and started organizing their own groups known as subreddits. Uh, and so as a result, the focus on you know, Reddit being the front page of the internet is no longer uh, that prevalent, but it's more about all different niche communities, those subreddits that maintain their own subcultures, thematic interests, and subject focus. In fact, there are over 100,000 subreddits nowadays exist um, on the platform. And uh, each subreddit is uh, managed and curated by members, so usually the group will have one or more moderators that kind of responsible to make sure that the conversations are in, you know, correspond the community norms. Each community will have their own norms established. Uh, they often refer as uh, reddit, you know, like etiquette, but the, uh, it was the reddit in front of it. And so there are some, uh, so Philip mentioned we designed communalytic as a way to study antisocial behavior, but we also realized that for some of these groups, antisocial behavior is actually the norm. 
So it doesn't necessarily be bad to have antisocial behavior. Uh, and in some groups, it is acceptable practice to uh, use swear words, but not in a way to attack uh, each other, but just in a way to, as a way to carry out conversations. So let's keep that in mind. And we will, we will revisit this, anti, how we define antisocial and how do we measure it uh, in two weeks when we meet again. Um, oh, another important uh, factor and affordance of this platform is that uh, community members can vote uh, on each submission, on each post that people share, and they can either upvote or downvote. A, a feature that is not uh, commonly available on other platforms like Twitter, um, and that makes it it's very interesting because you can actually see uh, how people interact with the platform, not just by liking it, like one-way interactions, but you can actually see a negative downward in, in kind of behavior. Uh, we also need to understand the demographic of uh, users of the platform when we study in any kinds of platforms. Um, so in Canada, uh, Reddit is not the most popular platform, but it's still within the top 10 platforms used here in this country. And in fact, what we're observing, we did survey with Canadians in 2017 and last year, and we noticed that uh, the percentage of online adults on the platform has actually went up from 9% to 15%. And this percentage may be even higher uh, because we only survey 18 years old and up. Uh, but if there's somebody on, under 18 on the platform, the percentage may go up. Uh, but when we look at the demographic characteristics, uh, you know, gender, age, uh, we see that it's a more male uh, dominated environment and it's mostly under 35. So keep that in mind because that actually tells you what, um, whose discourse you've been looking at and analyzing, whose perspectives. Another interesting aspect of uh, Reddit and Reddit community relatively to other platforms like Twitter is that uh, this group of users are quite in engaged. They active on the platform, they visit frequently. And so this, uh, these two charts coming from paper by Glensky and colleagues, where it shows you essentially uh, the number of subreddits same users engaged in. And as they spend more time on the platform, they actually engage in more than one groups. So, and that includes by loading viewing the pages as well as interacting. So upvotes, uh, posts and so on. The other interesting uh, point to make about the platform and highlighted here in this chart from a uh, paper by Sinner and colleagues, where it shows you kind of the progression uh, of what topics are being discussed on the platform and how that changes over time. And so what you can see here, essentially a list of different subreddits, different groups, uh, and uh, how their popularities changed from 2008, early years of Reddit to 2012. And so what you can see, Reddit really started as a front page of the internet, as well as the front page of their own platform, dominated interactions. So people would go there to see what's trending and that's about it. But over time, this, uh, this brown color uh, area, which referred to other subreddits emerged. So it means that more and more niche community form uh, around different topics. And that's what uh, attracts many researchers to this platform that instead of looking at specific, you know, overall conversations on Twitter, um, you know, even with, the, with our ability to study, when we study Twitter to limit uh, filter conversation by hashtags or keywords, it's not the same as looking at uh, more narrowly defined discussions around certain topics. And even though I should mention that majority of users uh, to Reddit are coming from countries like US, UK, and, and India, there are many uh, actually groups that are specific to a particular location. So when we were looking at some of the projects uh, last year to examine discourse around coronavirus and the pandemic in general, there are actually many subgroups specifically designed to discuss these topics in the context of different uh, geographies, different countries. Uh, next, let me briefly walk you through some of the studies done with Reddit data. Um, there are more and more papers coming out uh, focusing on the platform because of its growing popularity in the society in general, but it's still understudied uh, platform. And it might be, so that's why I think uh, for you, for this community, it might be useful to take another look at this platform. Uh, when I went to Web of Science the other day, uh, actually last week, I only found 194 papers 
that has read it in the title. So that really tells you that it is on the studied platform and there's, uh, it, you know, there are more potentials and opportunities for you here. Um, I'll just give you an idea what types of topics are being covered uh, in the papers uh, about Reddit. Uh, let's look at this one. This one published in Drug and Alcohol Dependence paper. So there are lots of health-related uh, groups on Reddit, uh, and as well as a lot of health-related uh, researchers are drawn to this platform to study. it. So this paper conducted uh, manual, manual content analysis of public posts on Reddit, and they specifically were interested how youth so young people discuss jewels, so smoking jewels uh, on the platform. They were interested in identifying reasons they start uh, smoking and uh, based on the essential content of their posts, uh, self-expressions. Um, so the popularity of jewels, you know, it's trending, you, your peers are smoking it, so I'm going to smoke as well, came out as uh, one of the most popular reasons. Uh, somebody was trying to quit uh, actual smoking, tobacco and stuff. Uh, and others just say, we won't smoke uh, to get a bus. So essential idea, uh, the type of this kind of content analysis can help help uh, researchers, public uh, health officials to develop campaigns uh, perhaps to combat, sm combat smoke and, and, and similar campaigns. Another study uh, look at more uh, conducted automated content analysis. So the, the previous one essentially required researchers to collect data from Reddit and then manually look through each message. This one uh, collected public posts uh, from certain groups and they conducted automated uh, analysis using natural language processing. And what you see here, these are the charts from the paper showing the posts on Reddit grouped by topics. There are lots of different topics uh, researchers examined before COVID-19 pandemic and after COVID-19 pandemic. And they look uh, specifically at groups that uh, dis discuss anxiety uh, type of um, you know, feelings and situations. What they found that the cluster of uh, this bluish cluster of terms uh, related to loneliness and even suicide exploded uh, during the pandemic. So the, those two clusters became much more prominent. So this is orange suicide cluster. So those are certainly concerns. Um, that can be discovered through this course on Reddit, especially for certain populations. Reddit uh, has also been in the news lately uh, for the presence of uh, some um, misogynistic groups on the platforms, and that drew attention uh, from some of the researchers to understand how that this course uh, um, happens, uh, how it uh, propagates, uh, does it stay in the platform or within certain groups or not. So this is an example of such study that explored misogyny across different certain groups, uh, such as uh, men going their own way or bad women's anatomy. Um, so those are the groups that are known for the use of extreme language uh, and expressing openly misogynistic, misogynistic discourse. Uh, what the researchers found so and so this one was kind of semi-automated content analysis approach where researchers collected messages for the, from the identified groups that they wanted to study. And then they applied existing dictionaries or lexicons that are specifically designed to catch uh, uh, hate, hate speech uh, and other violent language. So uh, nine lexicons they use included harassment corpus, violence verbs, hate base, profanity words, and incels specific words and more details in the paper. I will be sharing, uh, Philip and I will share slide deck after the presentation with you uh, via email so you can uh, revisit some of these papers um, on your own time. But what uh, the, the researchers found essentially by tracking the prevalence of messages uh, that include those uh, type of keywords in one of these dictionaries, uh, they saw the prevalence, the increased use of this lexicon over time on some of these groups. And you can see, for example, this is uh, coming uh, from one of the groups they studied. And the, uh, the red line represents uh, generally uh, you know, hostile conversations. And you can see in that particular group, the number of messages was, was going up. But uh, Reddit is not just all about uh, you know, hate speech and negative discourse. There are lots of communities on Reddit that support informal learning, uh, offer support to their members, 
uh, and generally welcoming environments. So in our own research, uh, we interested in looking at how social media supports informal learning. And so with, with my colleagues, um, Caroline Hathonswaite, Priya Kumar, sorry, Gilbert, Mark, Steve Delval, and Drew Pollen, we look at four groups uh, in this Ask subreddit universe. So there are some groups where people are invited to ask questions, so question answer groups. And most of the subreddits, uh, the names will start with the word ask. And they are domain specific. So one of the popular ones is ask science. Then you have ask politics, ask academia. Some of you may be part of the, that group, ask historians. And so the idea was to look at the groups that are known to welcome questions and answers and uh, to develop a manual coding schema to study informal learning as it happens uh, on Reddit, but we later expanded this, uh, this uh, classification to apply to other platforms like Twitter. Uh, so by looking at these four groups, we actually discovered that the most prevalent types of messages on these groups were uh, explanation with neutral presentation. So uh, Redditors are in these groups are trying to provide uh, uh, informative answers without adding judgment. Um, we also found though these groups tend to be um, the express um, people express uh, socially positive uh, messages so messages with positive intent uh, it the percentage varied across different groups ask academia was especially a welcoming environment 17 percent of messages included some form of socializing with positive intent uh, fewer of these messages were observed in ask politics so that one is interesting. Ask politics tend to be a bit more uh, kind of controversial. As a result, you can see that 18% of the messages in that group were classified as explanation with disagreement. But by creating this unique category, so we try to develop categories that are uh, kind of mutually exclusive. So you can create this kind of look at this and tell what kind of Reddit, what kind of subreddit it is, what kind of group it is. Is it welcoming environment? Is it question answer uh, environment and, and so on. And um, so if you're not tired yet of examples, I have just two more. And then we're gonna jump right into the uh, hands-on exercise together. So, so this one look at uh, specific subreddits. Uh, they split, uh, they look at anxiety subreddits four of them uh, as identify here in this table and also they look at the control what they call control subreddits those are subreddits on uh, general topics and uh, what they were trying to identify whether there are differences in how people express their anxieties or generally uh, um, talk about um, their, their stresses in life and uh, they apply different natural language processing techniques like ngram language modeling or vector embeddings, topic analysis, and so on. And so one of the examples here uh, shows you how uh, the groups where people discuss their anxieties, they will include words like my anxiety, social anxiety, my life, um, and so on. But when in their control groups, uh, the phrases that people tend to use would be like, we are, from the, we have, she was, so a lot of pronouns uh, they were with where sentence will start with pronouns. So there's a difference in the way we speak when we're talking about anxiety versus general topics. Uh, finally, moving from content analysis to network analysis, there is a small group of studies that look at how conversations unfold um, in these groups from the network perspective. We actually dedicated a couple sessions to look specifically at network analysis uh for during this boot camp and so i hope you can join us as well we will define uh what do, do we mean by network analysis we will define popular measures but just as a preview uh for example this paper try to understand can we detect a person a user who tend to be to answering a lot of questions uh, helping others in the community and known as an answer person so answer person uh, based on looking at their network uh, characteristics, based on how they appear in the network uh, structure of the conversation. And so on the left side in this chart from the paper, it shows the, the answer person will be in the center of this ego network. 
versus if the person just participates in a group discussion, uh, the, the network configuration will look slightly differently, where you can see more connections appear between nodes on the periphery as well. In the first example, there are no edges, or mostly no edges connecting other people. In our own work, we also use network analysis a lot. And going back to some of the ASK uh, groups, like ASK Statistics and ASK Social Science, we were trying to examine, again, informal learning uh, through uh, the network analysis perspective versus, you know, earlier we looked at the content. And so here we saw the, prior, the importance of reciprocal nature of conversations in the groups. So it's important. Uh, so a group that exhibits informal learning, you would expect people actually reciprocate me and reply back. Uh, it could be just simple thank you, but it could be a follow up question and so on. And it's also a transit transitive nature of the con con communications that uh, was unique to informal learning. Um, the other important point we found that moderators play a crucial role in the successful uh, groups on Reddit because they are the kind of gatekeepers of the conversation. They're able to, they have a lot of power. Uh, not anybody can be a moderator. You kind of have to deserve it. Uh, sometimes you start your own group and you become a moderator. Uh, but there's a lot, some papers look at this dynamics between uh, regular users and moderators or how people feel when moderators block or remove their messages. All right. Maybe we'll take a quick break for your questions right now. So if you have any um, urgent questions about the studies I've covered uh, so far, um, maybe now is a good time. I'm going to check the chat room. So by looking at some of the questions, uh, I see you asking uh, specifically about certain studies, how did we classify comments? In our previous work, if the question is related to our work on ask groups, uh, we manually, uh, we started by manually classifying messages in different categories. Uh, once we develop a well-defined categories, uh, we then recruited more of our research assistants from the lab to help us to prepare what we call training data set um, with more messages from uh, larger um, data sets from the same groups. And so once we have a couple thousand examples of how do you classify messages in different topics uh, or different mes message types, and then we applied machine learning to try to um, scale this, uh, you know, the coding up. And in fact, next week, when we talk about toxicity analysis, and so, what we offer offering through Communalytic is the access to Google uh, Perspective API. So we will discuss how that API uses machine learning to automatically classify and rank messages uh, based on the uh, toxicity of the language being used. And so, but uh, what uh, I guess the main point here to show that uh, there's a space for both a more kind of qualitative, small scale, um, small data type of studies, but also opportunity to scale up uh, your research, uh, depending on uh, what you're most interested in doing. Any other quick questions? Um, there are some questions in the chat if you'd like to address them, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's great. So I see a question from Anton and asking for um, when um, we're talking about the spread of misinformation uh, asking to clarify what, what do you mean by that, how one, one would categorize it. And certainly it's an, the question of how do you detect misinformation on social media is an active topic of many people's research agenda. Uh, what I've seen so far in some of the work we've looked at um, is to examine what links, what URLs people share in their conversations uh, and to determine whether they share links to credible websites or whether they share links to sites known to spread misinformation. There are a number of databases out there, uh, many of them maintained by journalists uh, that clearly have a list of uh, domain names identified uh, that spare, you know, known to spread misinformation or uh, known to spread information that is not verified. 
And so you can use those databases uh, to cross-validate with what's happening in your, uh, in your group. For example, when in the group you're studying, for example, later during this bootcamp, when we're going to look at um, crowd tangle and the use of um, their data sets from, uh, let's say, public messages from Facebook groups or pages, we're able to collect data sets based on URLs. So we can say, can you give us all the messages that share the particular link to your websites or news stories? So during that workshop, what we're going to look at, we will take a website that is known to spread misinformation and we will collect uh, kind of posts that share that link. And we create a network visualization to see how widely that link is spread and whether or not uh, it, uh, you know, different uh, discourse themes emerge around that conversation. Because sometimes people share a link uh, with um, to an uncredible source, but they actually will say uh, that this is not credible and, you know, just be aware. So th this is Philip again. So this tool is not designed to flag misinformation in the sense that, oh my God, that's a piece of misinformation, take a look at it. It's more designed for, hi, the, the misinformation has been identified, let's say by the mainstream media, or you might have seen it across your own uh, timeline. And you're like, that doesn't sound right. And then you say, okay, who else in uh, this particular network, Twitter, Facebook or whatever, who else is sharing this? You can then use that to then collect the data to say, okay, who else is sharing this? So that you can retroactively look back at the origin of that URL. Who was the first person to share that URL on this platform? Because the idea is that you wanna study those kind of phenomena so that way you can then use it in the future to build uh, research. You can use it to build systems that can detect um, um, piece of information that share the same fingerprint. Right now we're at the stage where we can basically just look retroactively say, okay, what does the fingerprint of a known misinformation campaign looks like? So that if we accumulate enough of those things over time, we can develop systems using that data to say, okay, here is a new one that's uh, just appearing that have many of the same uh, fingerprint marks as known misinformation campaign. So this particular tool, like I said, doesn't flag misinformation. What it does is it looks at things that have already gone viral as it were, and then say, okay, what was the origin of that? Yep. Who are the people, who are the accounts that started this conversation and sent this, this ship uh, sailing? Yep. And so I see a question from Brooke about does the system populate all the URLs being used in the group? Or do you have to manually go through and find all the links? So it, right now it does not do that automatically for you. It's some, somewhat a challenge for you know, developing a research tool to make sure that the tool offers some unique customi customizable features, but then the features should be general enough that can uh, fit many types of research questions. Um, so we certainly welcome uh, you know, these type of ideas uh, like Brooke, you suggested and perhaps um, we will uh, we, we should add it to our future development uh, work in the tool right now if you want to do this type of work uh, you'll you can collect posts from a particular group but then you have to uh, independently um, you know use content analysis to figure out which links are being shared for crowd tangle the reason i mentioned crowd tangle earlier the way the data has been collected via their platform allows us to say can you give us only posts that shared a specific link or specific domain name. So that uh, data source allows us to narrow down a little bit more. So it will depend on the data source we're using, uh, but that's why if you're able to attend all of the sessions in the bootcamp, that will kind of shows you uh, what kind of questions you can answer in the context of different data sources. I also see a question from Helen. Hi, Helen, uh, asking about whether this type of analysis is um, limited to English or not. Uh, so it's not limited to English. Certainly content analysis is uh, very language dependent in many respects. Um, the platforms that we integrate in, in Communalytic uh, now supports more than one language and they're not perfect. Uh, for example, we'll talk about in two weeks, Texas analysis from Perspective API supports eight different languages. Um, so it's not um, a lot of languages, but at least it's a start. 
uh, when we're building uh, some of the aspects of the tool right now, we, want, we, we are trying to integrate support for many, many languages. When we look at the data from network perspective, the language becomes less, less important uh, in the sense of kind of building communication network. So that, uh, I guess, it's the most accessible types of analysis if you're looking at uh, very international groups. Um, certainly, you probably want to have some capacity within your research team, language capacity to understand what's really happening beyond just looking at the, the network structures. Yeah. Uh, th there is a question, Hiba or Hiba, sorry if I mispronounce, mispronounce your name about spotting um, uh, understanding whether the group geographical location of the Reddit community. Uh, something I should uh, mention that uh, most of the conversation, most of the accounts on the platforms are anonymous, um, and there's very limited, uh, for good reasons, information about individual users. So, you, un unless you have some prepared access to Reddit backend, you're probably not gonna uh, know whether a particular user is coming from a particular location. So, you really should be cautious in terms of making any inferences or judgments about or oh, the users coming from certain areas. But what you can do is to look at the focus uh, of a particular group and uh, location specific groups will often include a name of that location in as part of the group name, like coronavirus UK or coronavirus Canada. So we don't really know if all of the people who discuss that topic are from that country, but we do know that the conversations are about that country and about that topic. And yeah, so the, the question so here will follow up about the fact that I mentioned that most of the Reddit users in terms of the numbers are from US, UK and, and India. And this is really based on the Alexa website, the website that uh, kind of monitors the internet traffic. Uh, and that's what they tell us. Uh, but the beauty is that we as researchers, we're not focusing on studying Reddit as the whole platform. Uh, so here, Communalytic is really designed to collect um, public posts for a specific group, group. So you have to identify group first. And so by looking at group specific to a particular location and topic, you kind of don't have to worry about that most of the Reddit users are from the US, for example. And another thing I just want to flag is that if you do decide to do research with Reddit, we include a nifty little tool um, within Communalytic so that you can find a subreddit. So if you're not familiar with uh, Reddit and you're not aware of the thousands and thousands of different subreddit that are available, what you can do is you can just type in a topic that you're interested in and say, okay, show me all groups that have discussed you know, that topic. And then it will give you a list and then you can go through and decide which one of those lists you want to get data from. And I see, uh, I see Sananda's um, message that your connection is uh, not very good today. So feel free to watch the recording. We will put it up on the Community website um, and we'll send you a link to the recording again. Uh, and we will t go back to discussing content analysis next week. Um, but just to make sure we're on time and I want to check, uh, we scheduled to go until 11.30. If you need to leave sooner, uh, don't, don't feel bad, feel free to drop out, uh, but we'll continue for another 30, 40 minutes. Let's move on to the next part, the, the hands-on part of this uh, event. And I think that's what you highly anticipated. Uh, before we start with the hands-on part, let me tell you how Communality collects data, because that will have direct implications to uh, what type of questions you can answer, your data, ask your data and answer. Um, well, in general, there are five, we identify five different ways to collect social media data. You can start with data, data grants. Uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon where you have um, nonprofits like Social Science One organizations in the US or platforms themselves. They would uh, package certain data sets uh, that would be topic specific like um, US election 2020, uh, or focus on mis misinformation, and they will allow researchers to apply to get access to certain data sets. Uh, in, in the social media lab, uh, we, we have access to some of these data sets, uh, but today we're not focused on them. The second uh, common approach to access social media data is through data providers or resellers. Uh, and uh, this approach is very popular among uh, for-profit organizations. 
uh, but it tends to be cost uh, too costly for us uh, researchers. This is when you have a third party, the co company that would have certain licensing agreements with platforms, uh, and they will uh, kind of repackage and uh, offer access to the end users for a fee. A third common approach is publicly available archives, and those archives often collected uh, by, you know, mostly nonprofit organizations or journalistic organizations with the idea of having uh, capturing some important moment in a society uh, through digital, uh, you know, through representation of that discussions about that event. Uh, they often collected uh, kind of to support uh, public research. Uh, Organizations like ProPublica, for example, had a couple data sets around uh, advertisement on Facebook. Uh, there is also a well-known Wayback, Wayback machine from the Internet Archive that uh, automatically kind of captures different content on the web, publicly available content. Uh, the limitation of this type of archives that they tend to be very limited and focused in scope and the sampling strategies are quite often uh, unknown or kind of fuzzy which makes it very hard to uh, develop a, and design well-defined studies uh, because we don't know necessarily how the data collected as a result we don't know what we might be missing they are good for exploratory analysis uh, certainly the, the web scraping um, uh, is another approach that uh, some researchers to choose to use. It's not uh, illegal necessarily, otherwise Google search engine will not be able to do what they do, but it's quite often against the terms of service by many platforms and generally uh, by some in our community is considered as a gray area, uh, questionable practice. A more preferred way to access uh, social media data would be through publicly available APIs. So let's just briefly talk about that. And this is what we use in, in the platform that Philip mentioned earlier that we developed, like Netlytic, like Communalytic we're talking about. And so APIs stands for uh, Application Programmable Interfaces. And it's a general data exchange protocol, protocol that allows platforms like Reddit, like Twitter, um, to make their data and services available to third-party uh, developers uh, who can then um, repackage it and offer new in innovative uh, solutions uh, to, to end, end users. And so even though APIs were originally designed for web developers, many researchers actually uh, found that this is the primary way they can collect data for research purposes. And so one of the advantages of using APIs is that uh, it follows, uh, strictly follows the privacy policies in terms of service by each of the platform. Uh, and so as a result, uh, if you access in data through one of these protocols, uh, you only have access to the data you actually have permission to access. APIs are not new. They've been around for over decades now, first popularized by uh, platforms like Google and Wikipedia. And now it's, it's a big, big uh, industry, big area, because they're so convenient for data exchange, exchanges between platforms. Essentially, the way it works, um, you as a researcher or developer, and in, in this case, it's, it would be Communalytic. The platform will send a request for data on your behalf. And then API, this machine readable protocol will understand that request, uh, get the data you requested, well, check to make sure that you actually have a permission to access it and you didn't, did not exceed the limit allowed you. And then once it's all checked, it will send the data back uh, to Communalytic in our case, and then you can download and analyze it uh, to your leisure. Uh, to understand how Reddit API shares data, let's quickly, uh, just quickly look at this one post from Ask. Trump supporters group. Uh, so ask Trump supporters group is where you can actually ask questions uh, um, uh, from people who actually support Donald Trump's politics to understand, uh, you know, why they support certain, uh, you know, certain policies that he had. And so this group, this example submission and submission is the post that starts a thread, starts the conversation. A submission often have either URL been shared or it will start with a question depending on the norms established by this community. What do you think of the Republican Party? That's how this submission starts. And then the message says, I get the impression from a lot of comments here that not all Trump supporters are GOP supporters. 
Uh, and so we also can see a username who posted this group. Uh, the user is honestly kind, kidding, honestly kidding, that's the username. Uh, the post was posted about a year ago. It attracted 121 comments and it got a score of 40. This score is based on uh, upvotes and downvotes. So it, keep in mind, and we'll see it in data later, that in fact, uh, the score can be negative if there are more downvotes to this post. So essentially, if other members of this community did, didn't find it useful. Let's look at how this message is represented in form of machine readable uh, protocol that uh, Reddit uh, supports. Oh, sorry, before we go to the machine readable protocol, I just want to flag something that's unique to Reddit, uh, that each subreddit, each group able to define um, their own flares. So flare is a concept unique to Reddit where a user can self-identify themselves based on different categories available to, to them, um, specific to specific, uh, unique to specific groups. So here, because questions about Trump's politics, uh, you can self-identify yourself as Trump supporter, as non-supporter or undecided. And it's help, it helps the community to, to keep conversation going. And in this case, the user self-identify themselves as non-supporter. Non um, and uh, so I see, Jamie, you have a question about uh, whether you allow to post the messages as part of your publication. I'll just quickly uh, answer it. it. Going back to research frameworks that Philip talked about, it will really depends what group you're analyzing. Uh, the, when we analyze in Reddit groups, in generally, it's a low risk uh, uh, groups in terms of showing the messages uh, because most of the usernames are anonymous. But if you are studying sensitive topic, a general suggestion would be to uh, hide um, usernames. Uh, but at the same time, if, the, if your research is about content analysis, I don't see how you can get away from not showing the actual you know, messages you're referring to. In some cases, when the content is very sensitive and you're really concerned about other users of the platform to re or reveal some certain information, what you can do is you can paraphrase a message uh, and then include it as part of your uh, as part of your public publication. So if you do any manipulation before you incorporate a screenshot as part of your presentation uh, publication, make sure you also acknowledge that because that can actually um, undermine your research uh, as well. That's a good question. But let's go back to the uh, the representation of this message in the machine readable format. So commonly APIs, application programmable interfaces, use a JSON format. So this is a JavaScript object um, entity format that represents a message in the form of uh, what we call key values. So the key represents the name of the field and then values essentially the value what it uh, stores. And you can see the flare for this user, non-supporter, will appear as flare, and then the value for that non-supporter. Then you can see um, something called self-text or body will include the, mess the body of the message. Uh, the subject line will be stored under the title field. Uh, you don't have to worry about how it's represented uh, in this machine readable format. But it is still helpful because at some point you might want to download the data set you've collected it, and the names, the names of these fields will appear in the Excel file that you're going to be analyzing potentially using other programs. So you need kind of to understand what it is, uh, what it is for. What I want to note that API, uh, for whatever reasons, they actually don't uh, provide the number of downvotes as a singular number. So if, even if you have in your uh, spreadsheet, uh, the down, downs, number of downvotes count, it's always will be zero. And this is just a limitation of the APIs. We'll go through some of these uh, fields later in the presentation. Um, finally, because uh, you know each subreddit has three types of posts, submissions, you just saw one, then people can comment on the submission. So that will be called comment. And then people can reply to comments. That will be called a reply. So what you see here is an example of a reply, uh, which will have very similar metadata elements. So username, when it was posted, the message. The comments, as you can see, don't have subject line because the conversations are happening under the same he heading that was introduced by the submission. But each comment also have 
the score. And in this case, people didn't like this comment, didn't find it useful. So it actually got more down votes than up votes. As a result, the total score is minus four. But in data, you will see that there's a type field and the type will indicate as, as a reply. So that's how you know in the data view that this is actually a reply. And so essentially, again, the point is why you need to worry about the, these different fields is when you if you want to download the data to your computer to conduct further analysis, you need to understand what each, each column actually represents. Any quick questions about data representation before we start the hands-on part? Okay, I don't see any questions so far and we have about 25 minutes. Uh, so we're gonna go uh, relatively fast. I understand many of you already on Communalytic and for some of you, uh, the steps I'm gonna show you already familiar to you, but let's see how you can start data collection from a subreddit. Uh, it's a two-step process. Usually you have to identify what group you want to analyze. Sometimes you have a specific idea already, but sometimes you just don't, don't know. And you know, I mentioned there are over 100,000 groups on, on this platform. So, so sometimes you don't know where to start. Uh, to help you with that, we have this uh, first step of this form uh, on Communalytic. And feel free to follow me as I go through these steps, where you click on search for a subreddit. Uh, it will bring you to this search interface where you can determine, uh, find groups based on keyword search. Uh, you can type one keyword, like let's say we're interested in groups that discuss coronavirus. Or you can uh, use Boolean search operators uh, to say, uh, to use either Boolean or or Boolean and operators. So if in this case, I'm using Boolean or, and this is a little bit unique to this interface uh, where you can use the vertical line to indicate Boolean or. So what this expression says, find all groups where messages mention either coronavirus or COVID. You, you can use a space. If you use a space between two words, it will be interpreted as and. So if you type root and space beer, beer and then it's, it will return uh, posts um, and groups that mention the root beer as a phrase. So you can explore that. And so once you're ready, you hit search. I'll pause here for a second in case you're following me because sometimes it searches live, so it may take a few seconds. So uh, I see a question uh, from Helen about any limits on the time frame for retrieving the data. So we'll talk about it in a second, but for this uh, subreddit search, this is you're not actually retrieving the data, you just using this interface to determine what groups to analyze. In general, the subreddit search in Communalytic EDU version, the one you're currently using, uh, only supports live collection. So essentially it will start collecting now and it will go until uh, for the se up to seven days uh, and then it will finish the data collection. Yeah. For the pro version where you have a bit more capacity up to 10 million records to store, we also implemented the historic uh, historical data collection. So there you can identify a time range and collect a bit larger data set. So as, as always, uh, before you start any analysis, uh, you, it will take you a couple trials and errors to identify the groups you want to analyze. You can always go I'm back. Totally and sorry, uh, Helen, yes. I just want to flag. I just posted a link in um, the chat. That link will give you the specific details of um, the parameters for data collection for each and every platform. Because Communalytic is designed to work with different data source with different limitations. So for example, what uh, Reddit gives you, what uh, Twitter gives you is quite different. And with Twitter, um, we also have different types of uh, API that uh, we have access to via Communalytic. So depending on the API uh, that you have access to, you might have different uh, research parameters and so on, but that 
particular uh, link provides you with all the details. So this way, you know what's the difference between pro and community and from one platform to another. Yeah, and so thank you, Philip, for that. And Manila, thank you for sharing the link to the parameters that Philip referred to. And I see Hiba, you have a question about, uh, you know, how do you narrow down your search from what I understand? And so you're looking for certain topics like intercultural, and you're not sure if you're finding the right groups. Well, sometimes you have to ask whether or not uh, participants, um, users of the platform will use the terms like intercultural to discuss the topic you want to study. Uh, so certainly you need a bit of more context uh, uh, and know what language that particular group uses. You can also use non-English words here as well. Um, super. Once you identify uh, the group you want to study, and in my example, uh, let's uh, assume I want to study IRS. So I search for any groups uh, that posted COVID or coronavirus, and this is a sample of uh, recently active groups. Um, and so IRS came up as one of the groups where port message included the term COVID in my case. And so I'm clicking on the start data color start collection on reddit and what it does it brings me back and so this is the group uh, I, i'm interested in exploring in this example um, also you can access if you click on the link provided in the second column which is subreddit this will actually open up a new tab or window in your browser and it will take you to the group so it's quite often helpful to see what this group is about for at least two aspects. First of all, pay attention to the about community. This will de describe what this group is about, what topics are being discussed. It will show you how many members of this group. Uh, because of the API uh, limitation, we're not able to collect uh, uh, messages from groups with more than 10 million members. Um, but that just, uh, there are not that many of those groups. The other thing you want to pay attention to is how active the group is. Because remember, this is a live data collection. Uh, if you set uh, to collect data for a couple of days and there are no new messages happening during that, those couple of days, you will, you will get an empty uh, data set. So when you click uh, on the group and you click on the tab called new, new will allow you to sort messages in the group uh, by the date. And so pay attention, there will be uh, kind of reference how, the, how long ago a message was posted. So in this group, we can see uh, some messages were a couple of days ago, some 25 days ago, but some were posted six hours ago. So it tells me it's not a hugely active group, but it's active enough that I might be able to capture some messages for the next week or so. And so once I sure that I want to study this group, I click on start uh, collection on. And that brings me back to the original form for data collection. So here, in addition to identifying the group you want to study, that's the sorry, second. Sorry, sorry, Anatoly, can I jump yeah. in real quick? Go so ahead, for the e, for the EDU version, you are only able to capture live data going forward from seven days from when you initiated the data collection. So, for example, if you started collecting on this particular um, subreddit it will monitor that subreddit and capture any and all new comments and reply and so on for the next seven days. With the pro version, you can do historical because again, this the EDU version is designed as a teaching tool to introduce um, students to social media analytics. And also because of the load on the system, we had to limit um, how and what type of data it can collect and store. So again, um, take a look at that link that I uh, shared earlier. So this way you can know exactly which of the system you should be using depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do a large scale study, then the pro version is the way to go. If you're trying just to figure out what this tool can do and uh, incorporating into the lesson plan, then uh, take a look at the EDU, but there are significant differences in the feature set and also in the type of data and how long you can collect data. So right. just be aware of that. Thank you, Philip. I also see a couple uh, questions coming in through the chat room. And I also forgot to mention that with us today, we have Tiago, who is one of the main contributors to Communalytic. 
um, and he will help you, can help you with your technical questions. Uh, so if you look at his username, it will say tech support uh, Tiago Ribeiro. And uh, he's here available. You can text him directly through this chat room. Uh, for some more specific questions, I see um, Jamie, you say you get in the message that you have too many data sets. Um, please follow up with us. Uh, and we have a designated email address. And Tiago will type it for us. It's ad admin at community.com. So we will make sure that you are able to use the system properly. It is, thank you, Tiago, uh, for that email. It is work in progress. And we want to make sure the tool works the way it can support your research best. Uh, the, the, yeah, there's a question. Uh, so let, let's just go through this exercise and we will revisit some of the questions, um, additional questions you might have. So in addition to deciding what subgroup to study, you need to provide a data set name just so you can identify it later in case you have more than one uh, data set from the same group, like in my case, IRS. Um, Philip already addressed the point about the start date because this is live data collection. It will start as soon as you start data collection, but you can specify the end date uh, because of the uh, infrastructure constraints and because many people are using it, we right now only support collection up to seven days. So you can set up from today till uh, till next week, essentially. Once the but data col collection mm -hmm. is complete, um, I'm just gonna finish Philip in a second. Uh, you can indicate whether you want to be notified when it's ready, so you can just use that check. Philip, over to you. Yeah, so for the pro version, you can collect data for up to 31 day going forward or for 31 day for any period in the past. So for example, let's say you found a subreddit that you wanna collect data on and you wanna collect, a um, let's say one year worth. So what you can do is um, collect 12 data set for each of the 31, you know, 30 or 31 day period in that one year. So in total, you would have 12 data set that will cover the entire year. Uh, the reason why we put in these limitation on the dates and so on is to control the number of data because some subreddit will have millions upon millions of um, posts. So this way, if you need a whole year's worth, you have to collect them in chunks. But like I said, with the pro version, you can go 31 days into the future um, from when you initiate the collection or any 31 day period that you're interested in on that subreddit in the past. Okay. Yeah. All right. Super. So now that you hit start data collection, you actually not going to get your collection right away um, because it's a live collection, but you should be able to see in your my data set page. Uh, the data set you've just created right away it will say uh, extracting until and the end date you specified and it will show zero but if you click uh, this refresh uh, progress button you will actually see that the number of records will change to 100 and this is actually will happen to uh, all of you why because we actually uh, able because the the way because the way a api api works it allows us to, uh, to collect 100 most recent submissions. So 100 most recent threats at the time you started the data collection. This is useful when you analyze in a low, tra low traffic, not as active subreddits, and you might not receive any new submissions or a lot of submissions during the next few days. So at least, at least this will allow you to collect 100 most recent submissions. And each submission will have a potentially multiple comments and multiple replies. So what will happen once we uh, the, the tool reaches the end date or the beginning of the end date, keep in mind the end date is uh, not uh, inclusive. The collection will stop at the beginning of the end date. For example, if it says uh, right now on my screen, extracting until uh, May 13th, it actually will end uh, at the beginning of that day. Um, and keep in mind that right now, the system, uh, the server time is UTS, Greenwich time, uh, just for standardization purposes. We are planning to ex expand the features to allow uh, each of you to select your local, local time zone for the purposes of data collection. But for now, all the end dates and start times 
uh, depending on that UTS time zone. So keep that in mind. So for example, mid midnight at uh, UTS time uh, here we in Toronto would be um, sometimes it depends on the if it's daylight savings, it will be 8 p.m. Uh, or 7 p.m. here. So keep that in mind. So once the uh, end time end date re reaches, this hundred uh, posts submissions will change to more comments and replies because the collection of comments and replies in response to each submission will happen at the end uh, once you reach the end date of your collection. I have quickly something to add, um, Anatoly. With um, the Reddit one, because it's collecting live data, you have to be um, judicious as to how, which um, subreddit you want to collect data from. Earlier, when Anatoly was uh, showing you how to select the uh, subreddit, you want to take a look at, for example, how many uh, members does that uh, subreddit have? So if you're using this as a teaching assignment and the assignment is due in two weeks, you don't want your student to be um, picking a group that has very few members, which means that they're likely to have not have any messages. And if the assignment is due in two weeks and they decide to um, launch and run this application two days before the assignment is due, guess what? Your da their data set is going to have nothing in it because nobody might have posted anything, right? So that's the kind of stuff that you have to be aware of if you're using this uh, for teaching and learning is that A, select um, subreddit groups that are active, uh, that have lots of members. So this way, you know that over the next seven days, um, there will be comments um, that uh, will be posted that you can select. And well, this yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead, Helen. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to make is that um, the if during those seven days, if anybody posted a message and they decided, you know what, I don't want to say that, I'm going to delete it. That's okay because the system will not collect that because remember, it only waits till the end of the seven days to then go back and says, okay, what was posted in those previous seven days. So this way, any messages that were deleted will not be included in the data set. So that's another thing that you want to be aware of. Because again, uh, it's a way for Reddit to and for us to respect the wishes of the people. Because Reddit is a public platform, but people you know, do change their mind. So if they change their mind and delete something, then our system won't collect it because uh, Reddit uh, doesn't allow it. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And just to summarize, there are three stages for this live data collection. Uh, again, it starts by collecting 100 most recent submissions. Then it continues keeping an eye on any new submissions. And then once it reaches the beginning of the end date, uh, it will start collecting comments and replies to all of the submissions that's been collected so far. And uh, that's why, as Philip mentioned, if messages were deleted since you started the collection, you will get a, a message, but it will just says delete it. Um, so you have a general idea of how many messages might have been deleted during the specific time period. Um, unfortunately, this is a bit a limitation of this way. Um, the way API works is that what happens in the past, some of the researchers wanted analyze, uh, to analyze very controversial groups and they started data collection, but then during the three or seven day period that they set up the collection, the group actually was shut down by Reddit. And so as a result, no messages were collected. So, so that's a limitation of the API and just uh, something to keep in mind when you're designing your research studies. But again, the, this is the EDU version. The pro version gives you the ability to collect uh, historical posts. Uh, so a subreddit that hasn't been shut down yet. Right. Uh, and to finally to, uh, you know, again, emphasize, I think this is just important point uh, to show what data you're actually going to get at the end of the collection process, because you'll have to describe it in your research papers. Uh, so I want you to fully understand how this API, the way we use API is structured. Uh, so the first two stages I mentioned that focus on collection of submissions. Uh, and by the way, this is a chart shows the number of posts per day. And so for this example, I collected uh, messages from group conspiracy for one day. I said I uh, started collection on February 14th. Uh, I guess I have nothing to do on Valentine's Day. Uh, and so I was on Communalytic. Uh, and so I set collection for one day. And I set the end date to uh, February 15th, which is not 
uh, inclusive of this collection, remember? So it's actually stopped the ADA collection at the beginning, at the end of February 14th, and it collected 516 submissions, this blue color bar, 516 submissions. At that time, what systems started to do to look for all the comments and replies in response to the submissions. And as it was collecting, uh, there were some additional comments and replies, the orange and green color uh, bars were happening during that night on February 15th. So as a result, you have this bit of spillover effect in this chart. So just keep that in mind. Certainly if you're working with the exported uh, CSV file, once you export the data set, you can then limit any dates if you don't want uh, to analyze the spillover, the any comments and replies. If it's not part of the February 14th, you can exclude that. So Again, this is um, uh, related to live data collection. Um, we have two different interfaces. So in the pro version, we have a different interface that says, you know, historical data collection. Uh, but the underlying concept is the same. Okay, great. So uh, let's move on. We have just barely five minutes and this is going to be the super fast hands-on part two. Um, so here, since you've started your data collection, I'm assuming, and you're going to be waiting for your data sets to be complete uh, either by tomorrow or a few days from now, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to explore other features of the system. And what I did, I collected a sample um, of messages from public group called Coronavirus Canada. And this group that's dedicated to discuss uh, ongoing pandemic uh, in the context of, uh, you know, in the Canadian context where we are allocated. And um, so I've collected uh, Reddit posts for this group for the first week of this month. And I packaged it, I saved it as CSV file from Communalytic and shared it via Google Drive. So if you go to, uh, bit.ly that reddit sample so it's on this slide the link and i'm gonna post it right now to download it so first you need to download the sample file to your computer and so save it somewhere where you know where you're gonna access it So as you're downloading this file, I wanna, you can open it in Excel. This is, you know, CSV comma separate value file can be opened in Excel or Google spreadsheets. Uh, and you will see this, uh, the structure we talked about earlier when we discuss APIs. You see columns like text, which represents the message itself, uh, but you see some additional columns. And uh, while you're downloading this file, I want to use this opportunity to highlight some important points about the format of this file. The, if the message was deleted, as we mentioned earlier, you still will see the message. And in this case, we see two messages. Uh, there's a title meaning that it was sub submission. It was a message that started a threat. The titles remain here, but the actual message indicated by API as deleted. Uh, earlier, I see in the chat room, uh, Anton, you asked if user was blocked. Uh, the message, I believe, will still say it's deleted, uh, and the user will be deleted, but API tends to preserve just if, to flag that there was a message, but you probably will not see the username, I believe. And now you can look at the column called type, so this is where you know for sure whether a message is a record is a submission, comment, or reply. Again, the difference between comments and replies is that comments are directly in response to submissions, and replies can be replied to a comment or replied to another reply. And to know this sequence of events, of interactions, there is a column called comment on, and there is an ID. So each post, uh, just like with any systems, it has a unique identifier. On Reddit, the identifier usually is a combination of characters and numbers, like you see here, uh, usually a few digits. And uh, so one, if there's some value, it means that the comment or post is replied to this message. And this is, by the way, information that net, the Communalytic will be using to build and visualize communication network. The other point I want to flag, there's a column called apps. So that actually, it says total score that you can see on the website, uh, and it's combination of number of upvotes minus number of downvotes. Uh, 
so the column name is apps, maybe misleading, but keep that in mind that it's actually a ratio, uh, not ratio, it's a, a subtraction, a number of upvotes minus number of up downvotes, and as a result, some of the values can be negative. So interestingly, uh, Reddit API only gives us upvote ratio um, for submission types. So what we can see here for submission, we see there was a all of the come all of the upvotes were positive and because the upvote is only one we're assuming that there was only one vote um, and so on unfortunately downvotes uh, information is not available again due to the restrictions to the api uh, the other two fields i think are important to highlight url and permanent link so what's the difference each post will have a permanent link attached and i think it's important when you're analyzing any kinds of social media data to actually see the message in the context of that environment, uh, you know, how it's been represented to individual users. So it, it applies to both. If you're doing quantitative work or qualitative work, I always advise people to go to the permanent link uh, if provided and look how the message actually visualized displayed to the end users and what features, what interaction features available to people to, to use in the context that post. And you can do that by clicking on this permanent link uh, field. Uh, there's all, the URL actually is something different. The URL field is only available for submission type of posts. So the, only the posts that start a conversation on Reddit will have a URL. Remember how I said Reddit is known uh, for the tagline that it's the front, front page of the internet. Well, if, uh, if somebody shares the URL, uh, the, the URL field as the beginning of the submission, the URL field will have that URL. So in this case, I'm highlighting this example links to YouTube video. The second example was linking to a news story on uh, Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. Uh, but sometimes a uh, message uh, doesn't refer to any particular external link. Uh, those tend to call self post. And it means that it's starting a thread, starting a conversation, but it doesn't really link out. So as a result, uh, what you will see in your downloaded data set, it will uh, have the same value as permanent link. I, I just want to quickly follow up with a couple of questions I see uh, from the chat room. Uh, Sananda asking that um, once you kind of import this file into Communalytic, if you try to run taxist analysis, it, the system will ask for API key and that's API key is referring to a prospective API, that service that we will discuss in two weeks time from Google that allows us to do machine uh, learning AI supported uh, toxicity analysis. So you certainly need to apply for the API in the follow-up email, in the follow-up email to this meeting, we will cir circulate a couple of things. We will circulate a link to this recording, uh, the slide deck, but we also uh, remind people to sign up for prospective API key. It's a free API key, but you have to apply to Google directly. This is uh, Philip again. I just want to flag something. Communalytic is basically providing you with a user-friendly graphical interface to access all these various API. We use API from Twitter. We use API from Google for the toxicity analysis. We use API from Reddit and from CrowdTango and so on. Depending on what platform you want to get data from and what type of analysis you want to conduct with the data that you get, you would have to apply for access. Because remember, we don't own that data. We don't control that data. We are simply the clearinghouse for you to go and get that data but you still have to uh, apply for the API key. Once you have the API key from, let's say, Perspective API, which is owned by Google, or from Facebook uh, to get CrowdTango data, you go and enter that into the system. And our system then talks to their system and says, hey, this person who uses Camelotic has been given access by you, uh, Facebook, or by you, Google. Uh, let me do what I want to do. But until you enter that API, Camille won't be able to do anything because the uh, system will say, who are you? Right. The only exception, thank you, Philip, for this um, clarification. The only exception is Reddit API, where we're currently using the site-wise API key. Uh, so we request it on behalf of the, our application. 
Uh, and right now it looks like it can serve all the needs of current user base. In the future, it may change. Uh, Reddit may want uh, each of you to apply for your individual API key, but we will notify you in okay. advance. So this is basically a way for the platform to decide who gets data and who doesn't, right? So you have to go and apply to them directly. And if you use it in a way that they're not happy with, they could cut you off. Um, but that has nothing to do with us, right? Yeah. Our tool simply let you access that data they have given you access to. Yeah. So let me just quickly finish the session. Uh, two more minutes, and I know we're um, running out of time. So if you have to run, um, feel free to go. It, like I said, it's recorded. Uh, I want to just highlight two last kind of types of fields in the Excel file I shared with you. And this is the type of uh, file you're going to be able to see for your own data set. The, there's a two column, there are two columns called karma, user link karma and user common karma. Well, uh, Reddit, Reddit has its own credit system. Uh, if you think about cryptocurrency, I think karma would be that type of cryptocurrency that each user might, might er, be able to earn by sharing uh, useful uh, resources that community members find useful. So by uploading uh, comments, or links that people share, you can earn karma related to comments or karma related to links. In general, uh, so the karma score stays with the user. And what you can see that whether or not post was made by a user who is perceived by others in the community as someone who provides useful resources. So that can be used in a number of different studies. The last two columns here, uh, they have flair as part of the name user flare and submission flare. I mentioned earlier, flare is unique to Reddit and it's uh, unique to specific group, to specific subreddit. So moderators of the group define what flares can be used. It's helpful to categorize the type of posts. So you have submission flare, you can say, oh, my submission, my uh, comment, my post is a question, or my post is about COVID-19 vaccines. So it helps people to uh, classify conversations it can also classify users. It's not required to use flares and some subreddits will not have flares. In this case, uh, in the example of Coronavirus Canada group, uh, the user flare only can have two values, none, you did not provide any, or moderator. It's really to differentiate whether a message was contributed by moderators. So uh, finally, uh, now let's import, if you haven't already, uh, import this data set into Communalytic. And because even though it's Reddit data set, because I shared it with you uh, via CSV file, we'll use CSV file import. Uh, you, similarly to many other platforms, all you need is to click choose file selected from your you know, downloads probably folder on your, on your computer, provide a name to the data set to differentiate and then hit import. Uh, there's a general limit uh, to download this file. Um, they cannot be more than 10 megabytes. Uh, if you have a large CSV file, you can uh, archive it using gzip program, and that can allow you to upload a little bit larger files. Uh, as long as they, but only keep in mind for the EDU version, only 30k, 30,000 records will be imported at once. Again, just to make sure that everybody can use the platform, as we have uh, many, many users using it simultaneously. So once you imported the, the data set, uh, it will appear under your My Data Set account. And the sample I shared with you will have 403 records. And now you're ready to click uh, on the zoom uh, kind of lens, the hyperlink uh, link to this data set to do overview. So that's the basic feature that you want to start by looking at how many messages were sh shared in this group over time. And the color can highlight how many were submissions, how many comments and how many replies. Replies are green color, comments uh, orange, and blue. Uh, then you can scroll down. Oh, by the way, before you scroll down, I just want to uh, zoom in some to show you something you might have missed. There's an export and edit this chart in Plotly link. Uh, we're using Plotly um, JavaScript visualization engine to visualize some of these charts within the browser. But the advantage is that you can export the aggregated data in this chart to Plotly, this uh, third party platform, to customize it for publication purposes. Uh, because once you're in Plotly, you can see, still see this chart, number of posts over time. You can see the data that has been used to generate it, but you can also customize it. You can change uh, headers, X and Y uh, labels, and colors uh, to, to represent it the way you want. 
Then a, another common visualization, just to summarize, frequently used words in the word cloud. Uh, again, you can download the list of uh, frequently used words as Excel or CSV or a picture. Uh, at first, when you see this page, it will only show the first, uh, word cloud based on the first 1,000 uh, messages uh, just to manage the uh, load on the server. But there will be a button at the end. If, you have, if your data set exceeds 1,000 uh, messages, you can recreate this chart based on the full data set. And, and then, so once you recreate this chart and you download it using Excel or CSV link, you actually have the full, what we call word frequency table where you have a column with all the words, unique words that are being discussed by this group and number of times they are mentioned. Uh, we exclude common words like known stop words in 15 different languages. And we exclude numbers and links to make this word cloud more uh, kind of content and topic focused rather than uh, you know, seeing functional words. Uh, there are additional charts. Uh, just give you again, uh, are there many active posters? Top 10 posters, or is there's like uh, one person dominating the conversation mm -hmm. and a chart a box plot showing your general engagement in the group based on those uh, upvote scores that you've, you've seen. And that's it for today. Thank you for those of you who were able to stay all the way till the end. Um, if you have questions, um, we will stop recording. I will, be, Philip and I will stay a little bit uh, longer if you have additional questions. Otherwise, email us at admin at That's the designated email for this platform and we will be able to help you.